Hey everyone, it is the top of the hour, so we're gonna get started. I am Elise Mayer, the VP of Marketing at Smashfly, now part of Symphony Talent, um, and thanks for being here today. Before we dive in, I wanted to share that over 700 people registered for this webinar across the country and potentially across the globe. Um, it's been a really trying and scary and uncertain time for all of us these last few weeks. So we really wanted to say that we appreciate you joining us because we really are all in this together at, at a time like this. I find a little bit of comfort that we can still come together and learn and discuss and grow. So of course we're here to talk about recruitment marketing benchmarks and how the pioneers differentiate themselves but we'd be remiss if we didn't try to address how all of these strategies can play a really critical role in communication and employer branding at a time like this. So we don't have all the answers. Shannon, who's our guest from Republic Services, um, he doesn't have all the answers either, but his perspective is gold right now. And so we're going to do our best to, to address all of those strategies and how it, it might help in a time like this. First, today's session will be recorded and the link to the recording and slides will be sent to your inbox in about 24 hours. Um, so just look out for that. And then in terms of audio, if you're having any difficulty, you are automatically dialed in through your computer. So you can definitely try to dial in by phone if you're having any issues. And then please make sure you're not muted and that your volume is up. Um, and then lastly, we're gonna to try to save around 10 minutes for Q&A at the end of the session to ask us anything about the research. And of course, to kind of give you a chance to ask Shannon directly um, everything that's going on right now and kind of what he's doing at Republic Services. So please feel free to type your questions into the pane on the control panel or just tweet us at Smashfly. And now I will hand it over to introduce two of our main speakers as I'm just the moderator for this. So Raquel, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Thanks, Elise. Uh, hi, I'm Raquel Lawrence. I'm the marketing manager here at Smashfly and Symphony Talent. And I was also the lead researcher for this year's Recruitment Marketing Benchmarks Report. Uh, a little bit about me. I originally started my career in government and nonprofits, actually, working um, for an economic development organization supporting small businesses with marketing. Um, as you can imagine, you don't get to flex many creative muscles in that space. So then I pivoted uh, and began working as an advertising copywriter and account executive for B2B and consumer brands, and then eventually uh, uh, employer branding as well. And that combination of experiences really fueled my interest in economic mobility and the ways people find work. Uh, that eventually led me here to my six year career now in TA technology um, with Smashfly and Symphony Talent. So I'm excited to share with you some of what I learned along the way and especially um, what I was able to learn in doing the research with this year's RM Pioneers. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Shannon Taylor. I'm the Director of Talent Acquisition at Republic Services, um, and Republic Services is where the one of the largest or leading um, waste and recycling companies in the country. Uh, we're publicly traded on the New York Stock Exchange, and um, you know, obviously, in this time, an essential service. And so, I oversee our talent acquisition uh, department with uh, about 70 talent acquisition professionals. We do about 13 hires annually, and really excited to be here um, to share my perspective and some of the exciting work that we've done. Um, over the last year from a recruitment marketing perspective. Um, so thank you for joining and, and look forward to sharing my, uh, the, uh, the result. And Shannon, thank you for being here. I know it's been such a crazy and hectic time for you. And seriously, thank you to everyone, every single person at Republic Services who is really like keeping the world going right now. So we, we, we really appreciate you, you taking the time. Um, thank you. So what, what you're going to learn in this webinar, um, surprising benchmarks on the recruitment marketing adoption over five years. We're, of course, going to dive into critical examples of what the recruitment marketing pioneers do differently and really kind of show those examples and some of that language, especially from Shannon and Republic Services. And then we're also going to uh, try to address what's going on currently with COVID-19 and kind of how the, these foundational strategies might be able to help. And of course, give you a chance to ask questions at the end. You may have read this report since its inauguration uh, five years ago, or you may have never even read it, even now sitting on this webinar. So no worries, this is what we're here for. But I'll tell you this about um, our, our Fortune 500 benchmark report. 
it, it really started when recruitment marketing wasn't a thing yet back in 2015. We were still trying to get a Wikipedia page up and get a definition going. And so this report is kind of a benchmark in, in itself. It's really written proof of how we've grown and also not grown as an industry in a half a decade. It's also a lot of data. You can see we um, score the talent networks and career sites of 500 companies every year. And this has amassed probably 25,000 individual data points every single year. And when you look at that over five years, you know you, you can do the math, math off the top of your head. Um, but as you're gonna hear us talking about recruitment pioneers and other grades of how we're measuring maturity, I wanted to give you just three quick thoughts. Um, number one, the A's are the standouts. We'll of course get more into what they do differently, but it's not easy to get an A in this report. So a lot of kudos and congratulations goes out to those companies. Um, that being said, the discipline and in our industry has grown year over year. So of course, since 2015, we started scoring these adoption strategies harder. And what I like to say is talent is scoring us harder every single year, so we need to do the same. We're trying to, um, to score all the companies at that kind of talent expectation level. And then lastly, we look at the status quo as of course that C grade. So that's kind of what the majority and the average company, um, company is doing. I wrote this on LinkedIn um, a few weeks back when the report launched, but I feel like I can say it again. You can look at the data in this report in two, week, two ways, either positive and hopeful or negative and disappointed. And we're gonna go through stats that probably make you feel both throughout this webinar, but I'm gonna start out with the positive. So for the first time in five years of doing this, the Bs took the majority of the Fortune 500. Uh, for the previous four years, C, that status quo kind of average grade was the majority. So what's really exciting is that we're upping the status quo. Um, and, and everyone's getting a little bit better. 46% of the Fortune 500 either scored an A or a B this year, and that's that pioneering or predictable strategy. So the good are getting better. That also means that the longer you wait to catch up to the good, the further you get left behind. So that C's, D, the C's, D's, and F's are losing competitive advantages every single day by not adopting some of these strategies. The other thing is that the A's and B's now have more competition. And I know Shannon will talk to this, but the, the highly mature recruitment marketing programs, the A's, are up from just 3% of companies in 2015 to 16% today. That's 79 companies within the Fortune 500. So still a small portion, but it's growing. And the, the number one thing you'll learn from these companies is that they feel like their work is just getting started. And that's exactly why we started awarding these A companies the Recruitment Pioneer Award, because they're constantly blazing a path for everyone to follow. Before we dive into the details, I always find it fun to check out correlation. And of course, as a researcher, and I know Raquel can attest to this, we really wanted to validate our research across other really pivotal metrics like revenue growth and Glassdoor reviews and um, employer brand ratings. So we really want to see, do the A's in our report actually stack up elsewhere? And you never really know what you're going to find. So like I crossed my fingers and like hope that it all made sense. And it really does. Year over year, the data shows that a higher a company scores in recruitment marketing adoption, the higher its average revenue and the higher its average Glassdoor ratings and recommendation score. So of course, there are a lot of var variables in terms of profitability. So it's not causation. But I think this is a really interesting finding that I feel like is really easy to believe. Companies are more successful when they have a defined and well-executed talent acquisition strategy. So Shannon, you being a director of TA, is this believable to you looking at this correlation? Absolutely. You know, when you think about talent acquisition and your recruitment and your, and your strategy around employer branding, it's key. Um, thinking about for us at, at Republic Services, we, we want a clear, consistent message because for us as an organization, we are not a consumer brand, right? So we don't necessarily have uh, Super Bowl commercials or we don't really sponsor large scale tournaments and things like that. And so our, our sort of customer recognition is very low. Um, and from that, from that perspective, however, uh, everyone knows who you are when you don't pick up the trash on time, right? And so when we think about how do individuals engage with our brand and know us as an employer, 
it, it sort of drives us to do the different things differently and have it a part of a large scale strategy. And what I mean by that, at least, is, for example, we need to make sure that we have how we're going to message and what our voice is going to look like. But we also have to align that to what is our candidate experience going to look like, whether a candidate is getting the role uh, and, and hired or if they're getting turned down, what is their overall experience like? Because those things are the things that are going to correlate back to their recognition of our brand, their experience, our Glassdoor rating, overall yep. at some point being a customer and overall success as an organization. Yep, definitely. Um, and I think it's interesting that five years ago, we didn't even know you would be here today, but five years ago, we actually highlighted Republic Services as one of the pioneers in mobile friendliness. So I find it very luckily coincidental. We did not know this as when we invited Shannon on this webinar. But another interesting benchmark here is that mobile optimization is one of the only recruitment marketing tactics that is nearing 100% adoption of the Fortune 500. But we'll say that it took five years to get there. And if you guys remember, five years ago, mobile get-in was a huge thing that you know had warning signs everywhere. It was really pushing companies to rethink their mobile optimization strategy based on really major Google alg algorithm changes. We did this research right after that came out, and you can still see that only 59% and 36% respectively of companies had mobile optimized job search and career site. Five years later, we're finally seeing that almost at full adoption, but it's really crazy because the average person today spends more than three of their waking hours on their phone. So I guess my, my major point looking at five years of trending here is that even with a major push from one of the biggest organizations in the world, Google, it still took a while for talent acquisition to really change in adoption of this strategy. So Shannon, given everything like going on right now with COVID-19 and being agile and having a foundation to really communicate around this, do you think that talent acquisition kind of needs that push and kind of needs a, a big event to really rethink how we're approaching employer branding and tech? You know, at least it's very interesting. And one of the things that I use a lot is, you know, necessity breeds creativity. And one of the things that we've fallen into is specifically as we're in this sort of unprecedented time with the COVID-19 situation is how do we now reach out to candidates in a way that we've never had to do it before on a scale that we haven't never had to do it before? And when you think about it from a Republic Services perspective, and we're looking at you know, how people are engaging with us, 70% of our, our, our visitors to our career site visited doing a mobile device. And so it's only going to increase even more. And so having a mobile friendly, meeting your, your candidates where they are and providing that seamless experience that they're used to in their daily lives is going to be more and more paramount. And so do we need that big push? I think we're at the point where, we, where we're now feeling that big push. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're totally right. And being where candidates are, that's a great segue into handing it over to Raquel and talking about email and tax and talent networks and how we're actually communicating to talent. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so if you think about recruitment CRMs or talent networks, that technology has actually been around about as long as smartphones. So we're nearing about 15 years, um, but still they aren't nearly as common or well utilized within the hiring process. So while then less than half the Fortune 500 companies have a talent network opt-in, uh, actually about 43%, uh, it's really great to see that about a third of them at least make that option available within the actual job application. And that's a significant increase in adoption from last year, from going from 18% to 30%, uh, it's just happened over one year's time. Um, the thing is with a simple, really simple call to action, you can enable candidates to join a talent network in the matter of seconds. And that way you're getting to know at least the basics about them, their contact information, their interests, and then you're protecting uh, those 90% of candidates who would have dropped off and possibly would have never come back to your career site. Um, so the next step is how do you utilize that information that you've collected uh, in a meaningful way? When a candidate joins a talent network, it's, it's meant to be the beginning of what's hopefully a very long lasting relationship between employers and their people. Uh, so it's just as, important, just as important for them to get to know you as it is for you to learn more about them. Uh, so that's why it's pretty disappointing when you see here that uh, of the companies that do have a talent network, um, almost half the time, they never send anything after the confirmation email. And even when they do communicate, they don't really say very much. 
uh, only 8% will send any other content besides jobs. But relevant content for candidates is an extremely important differentiator for companies like the RM Pioneers. Um, if you look at the A scoring organizations, 22% of them will send content other than jobs, compared to less than 1% of the C, D, and F scoring companies. So when you boil it down, a successful candidate nurture strategy has always been about three things, content, consistency, and creating a connection, a meaningful connection between employers and their people long-term. Um, so even when you look back five years ago to the original benchmarks report and the glossary um, that we included back then because it was a new term, when we define recruitment marketing, um, you'll notice that there, there are probably some tactics we would add to the mix today. Um, you'll notice we don't even mention artificial intelligence or video in here, which are really critical tools in today's hiring mix. But the overall mission really remains the same. It's focusing on that last line there. You wanna convert candidates into more qualified applicants to fill jobs now and in the future. So to convert, they have to take an action or raise their hand in some way to show you that they're engaged with your brand uh, by, for example, clicking on that CTA button to join your talent network. Then to get more qualified applicants, you really have to give them the background that they need to make a well-informed decision. If candidates can get a more authentic view of your organization and they, they can actually help screen themselves in and out based on the level of their interests and really the connection that they feel to you and to your organization. Then when you're able to connect with the right talent and give them all the tools they need to, to successfully apply, that builds trust and affinity with your employer brand. Uh, and that's really the warmth you need to nurture a healthy talent database. And that's one that you can then turn to with confidence no matter what may come in the future or what kind of hiring challenges may arise. And that's why today we're really taking a focus and honing in on the group marketing pioneers. Um, and these pioneers, they're the Fortune 500 companies that scored an A in our recruit marketing benchmarks report, but they represent so much more than that. These are organizations that were really intentional about achieving their hiring goals. They're the TA teams that keep pushing the limits. They learn, they continue to experiment because they know that change is inevitable. And, and more on a larger sense in this scale, that the talent experience is, is never stagnant, it's always changing. So I wanna show you some things of what recruitment marketing pioneers do best. And I think at first, our recruitment marketing pioneers, they create a strong foundation, they know how to nurture talent relationships at scale, and then they test and refine those strategies to meet hiring challenges as they arise. So one thing we know is that overall, recruitment marketing pioneers or those ACE organizations, 100% of them have a talent network. But here's some other areas I wanted to highlight where they also stand out from the crowd. One, they tell a more complete employer brand story with visual content. 32% of them use images or video in their job descriptions compared to only 6% of C's, D's, and F's. They also leverage the skills and interests of their candidates in their database to send more personalized jobs to their talent networks. And that way people can find roles that actually fit their interests and can see themselves in those positions and they get through the application process much more seamlessly. Next, they know how important it is to stay on top of mind with consistent communication. They're sending monthly outreach to their CRMs. As you can see, 84% of A's will send a monthly communication compared to just 7% of C's, D's, and F's. And lastly, they're almost twice as likely to acknowledge diversity and inclusion initiatives on their career sites. And that empowers a much wider range of people to be able to see themselves as having a space to belong, seeing themselves included in your, in your company culture and in your employer brand. Um, Shannon, out of these, are there any in particular that really stand out to you as a, as a key tactic that you use at Republic Services? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you think about um, developing that strategy and leveraging and connecting with your talent network, and, which will then ultimately increase applies, you, it's leveraging all of these across the board. You know, one that we leverage quite a bit and one that I'm very passionate about is images and video. Um, I think people, if they can see themselves or see something like themselves in a video doing the roles that they, they're, they're finding connection. Um, also, the, around the consistency of communication and really being able to um, not necessarily become white noise to a candidate um, or someone that's in your talent network, but also providing content that's meaningful. Um, that's not just about jobs, but about good things that are happening within your organization and things that people can hold on to. 
Um, and then diversity is just how you're leveraging those images, how you're speaking to that group, and then making sure that you are putting your content in places that are gonna that are gonna connect with a diverse group of people. So across the board, all of these pieces are very important as you look to you know have a successful recruitment marketing strategy. Absolutely, and I think as we're looking more into what a modern talent acquisition strategy looks like overall, um, that really comes into play here, especially in times of crisis where communication is really everything. And all these TA teams, our HR teams in general right now are really challenged with thinking about and needing to address all of these audiences that we see here throughout the entire talent life cycle. Um, from interns to alumni to rehires to current employees, referrals, each of these audiences have a very specific um, need and you need to be able to be really agile to communicate with them in a meaningful way, utilizing technology that you have at your fingertips. Um, so you've probably all seen different versions of this TA Infinity Loop, but the, the same idea remains. Um, when you find great people, you want to hold on to them. And if you can, you want them to bring their friends along as well. Um, so to do this, I think what Shannon was kind of explaining here as well is that employers are, are learning that they have, have to be a little bit more introspective and start to draw clear connections between their current employees' experiences and draw those conclusions to the company's larger mission and their plans for the future. Um, generally, you want to understand, better understand the people who are valuable to you, help them tell their stories, and give them opportunities to grow. Um, and I think Republic Services overall does a really incredible job of this. Um, so Shannon, um, when you think about the full talent lifecycle and your RM strategies, uh, how, how has your technology, I guess, helped you um, activate your RM strategies or, or helped you in this current situation um, you know, that we're all addressing right now? Yeah, I mean, it's been really interesting. And, and, and before I um, go into that, I really wanted to mention that on that, Infinity circle, right? Is as you're talking through your your RM strategy, you know, it's it's not that short term solution. Uh, as you look at that sort of infinity loop, right? There's a piece, and everyone that comes in in, in contact with the organization at some point is going to hit a piece of that life life cycle. So as you're developing that that RM strategy, not to look on a short term, but a long term view, um, so that you can take the mindset that everyone in your talent network um, is valuable, and making sure that you have messages. Uh, for each group uh, that you're consistently massaging and uh, and looking at and sending out and then measuring results um, and making sure that you're meeting those individuals where they are wherever they are in that infinity cycle to have the maximum return on them on on the effort and then you know if we as we tie into uh, republic services as a whole and you know our value our employee value proposition just to give everyone a little bit of context of of who we are at republic um, we are 36,000 strong and growing. We're about 10 billion in revenue. Um, we have a very large fleet of about 16,000 trucks, and we do about almost 5 million um, pickups every single day. And we operate in about 41 different states, including Puerto Rico. Uh, so we are, you know, a major part of the the U.S. Um, we're an essential service, and it's specific specifically in times like this, um, we're we're needed more than ever. Um, one of the, the things that I think is is, uh, is important is that we have to get the trash off the ground. COVID-19 is a really big um, issue for a, a lot of individuals across the country, but I will tell you all that if the trash sits on the ground, we have more things to worry about than just COVID-19. And so, um, you know, our, our 36,000 employees are out there every day making sure that we are servicing the community uh, and making sure that they're safe and clean. So, we're definitely excited and proud about that. But as you sort of think about your, our journey uh, in the recruitment marketing space, you know, I, I sort of describe it as it's been an evolution for Republic Services. And it, it's not necessarily a, a sprint, but it's a marathon, right? So I always say it's a marathon, not a race. And so if you look at, you know, where we've been, uh, if you look back to 2016 to see where we've been, what you'll see is that um, our career site has will evolved, right? So we we had a pretty good site, right? We worked hard, we make an impact, we earn recognition, and those are things that that people can connect with. Um, however, what it didn't really do is it didn't have a connection that people could grab onto. And so as um, as I joined the organization, and we really looked at how do we now build a employee value proposition where our people will then hold on to something. We tried to figure out what are the themes 
that are going to be important, not only to, to one group of folks, but across a, a, a demographic of people in, in various generations. And so we had come up with this new, um, we had come up with this new sort of uh, EVP called the um, We Work for Earth. And the We Work for Earth um, kind of was breed out of three, three different themes, which was family, uh, community, and sustainability. And so through that, we, what we were able to do with that We Work for Earth campaign is really highlight our frontline employees, which are our drivers, our technicians, our laborers and sorters, to show individuals that, you know, our organization is a very diverse organization. We, we are doing things for the earth and the community, and you can too. And here's some stories about individuals that are doing those things, whether it was um, Lakasha, who was a former bus driver who uh, we told her story and shot a video about how she transitioned into Republic Services and building a career for her, to Katina, who likes to hike, and um, to Tito, who is a driver and has built and raised his family, and actually his son works for us as well, and, and, and bringing all of those things together around how they are, one, developing a career, how they're, you know, creating a, a um, you know, creating generational wealth for their families, and then they're also doing good in their community. It has really been the driver behind the, the campaign that we have. And as you see there on the screen, and I encourage you all to take a look at our site and look at the videos, and you'll see how we've created these stories and able to connect people to the, to the jobs that we have and to Republic Services as a whole. And ultimately, if they're not looking for a driver role, they will get the feeling and understanding that us as an organization are connected to the community. We're connected to doing what's right for the earth and, and doing sustainable dis disposable of, of waste. And also that we have opportunities that may be interesting for them and what we are a diverse organization uh, along the way. And then Shannon, as we go I, into the oh, next one. Sorry, Shannon, I just wanted to say, we work for Earth is like amazing. I'm a marketer and like you should come, you should come, come up with taglines and EVPs for us because I think it's so powerful. It's so smart. Um, given kind of all of our movement as people, I think like as a, you know, the younger generations and now older generations are all getting involved. And I think this like charitable brands that do good for earth, even consumer brands. So it's just really smart and like really impactful. I just had a quick question because I feel like we get this a lot. Where did you start for employee stories and was it easy? I know I think it seems daunting to get people to share stories and turn it into formats. Can you just give us like really quick, like one, two, three, like how you got this going? Yeah, absolutely. So one, uh, the first thing is we really needed to figure out what we were going to come up with, right? What was going to be the, the theme? Um, and so that was number one. And we did that just through, we partnered with our in, our marketing team as well. And we threw a lot of ideas around. And I wish I could say I was the only one that came up with this, but we massaged it quite a bit. Um, so that was one piece. So once we had done that, then it was the second piece is understanding what is the need, right? So what are what is the point and why are we doing it? And what is going to be our target audience? And so where we started was with the biggest need in our business is we piggybacked off of another campaign, which was our She Drives campaign, which we really wanted to um, increase the number of women garbage truck drivers in our business. And so to do that, we, we sort of took that theme and said, we're going to now drive it to everyone and do more. We're going to drive into women. We're going to drive it to diverse individ diversity. And then we're also going to tap into our young and a generation around sustainability. And so with that, that's kind of how we came up with sort of how we're going to now tackle it. And then from a stories perspective, we, we went out on the last pieces, we identified employees, we, we pre-interviewed them, learned about their stories. And then um, from there, we decided how we were going to mesh those together and pick the right ones to, to drive the videos and, and create the storyline. Awesome. All right, th th thanks for sharing. I know I, I jumped in. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. No, it's great, great question. Um, and so if we go to the next one, what you'll see is we it's been in a continuous evolution. Um, recently, we redesigned our career site with our we work, you know, driving off of our we work for Earth campaign. Um, but one of the things that was really missing uh, for us, specifically because we are based in Phoenix, Arizona, the Valley of the Sun, and is that we we, re, we do relocate quite a few individuals, or they also relocate to to Phoenix to come join our organization. And we didn't have a way or a place to really point those individuals to say, come work for us, and here's why you want to come live in Phoenix because it's a great place. 
And so what we did is we said, we're going to create a specific landing page where we can point to folks that are visiting our site or candidates that we're actively engaging on why they want to come to Phoenix. So we named that page, Why Phoenix? And so here, what you'll see is just a quick snapshot of, you know, an image of our, our, our valley downtown, you know, but also talks about the opportunities and sustainability. It talks about the, the benefits of having outdoor entertainment and the outdoor lifestyle with hiking and biking and all these other things. It talks about the different sports, right? So we have all of the major sports here and spring training um, in Phoenix. And so we created a site that really would engage and keep people on our career page longer for longer engagement. And so they would continue to click deeper and learn more, not only about the community that we're in, but about Republic Services um, as a whole. And so we're really proud of um, that site. And uh, so I encourage you all to take a look at it. Uh, but it, it has really been something that we've been able to connect to uh, and connect our, our, our audience to, um, to just more than, to, to, to can be just more than jobs, right? But it's, it's really about a feeling, a connection with Republic Services and what we do as a whole. Yeah, but uh, and then, so true. I, oh, sorry, Shannon, I just wanted to add, like, we always say that yeah. people don't make connections with jobs, they make connections with brands, they also make connections with cities and people, and so I think that's so smart that you're kind of tackling it from all angles, because now, I mean, people are willing to move for amazing companies in amazing cities, working with amazing people, and it doesn't, it just doesn't come down to bullets in a job description, so I love that, that's how you're structuring your site. Yeah, and I 100 percent and at least it really one of the things, too, is is when you think about and I say I've said this a couple of times already, it's really meeting the candidates where they are and knowing that everyone's interests are going to be very different and everyone's reasoning as to why they want to engage with a particular employer is going to vary. And so having a multifaceted approach around how you're going to provide those things for each one of those groups as much as you can is going to be the, the, the difference between them staying on your site for a minute versus them staying on your site for three minutes and diving into six or, you know, six or so pages and ultimately yep. applying for an opportunity. Um, and, and so, yeah, it's definitely a multi-pronged approach and, and something that is, um, you know, we're really excited to be you know, testing out and seeing what works and what not works. And so if you look at, you know, our, our, our jobs, right? If you look at, you go to our career page and you look at just our job postings, you know, our employee value proposition is really about serving the greater, you know, a shared purpose, right? It's above the fold. It's the contents on our job page that talk about our people. It talks about our mission. It talks about what motivates you. And it really talks about, you know, showing you a video about kind of our people and who we are and what we do. Um, and then it also has an opportunity, even on that career, on that job posting that says, even if you're not ready, once you join our talent network, you know, if you enjoy the content that you're seeing here, maybe timing's not right, we'll provide you the content that may be intriguing, something you can know about, we'll share some jobs with you from time to time. And so, you know, go ahead and join our talent network. But if you are ready, here's a quick and easy way to go ahead and apply now. And so, you know, in one page where someone can get it very quick and easily, we've now created a way for us to um, provide an, a, an, an opportunity for those to uh, either apply for a job, learn more about us, or join our talent network, and we're able to capture those audiences. And so as we, you know, one of the things that I was wanted to share, too, as we were on the call, and it really, uh, you know, it, it drove a lot of the things that we've been doing is, um, around leveraging our talent network and being smarter about how we engage those individuals, um, but also leveraging our employees to help us drive the message. And so, you know, last year we were really ta tasked with trying to fill classes within our call center. Um, and as you all know, up until recently, uh, the unemployment rate was 3.5%. Uh, you know, candidates had a lot of options and applicant flow on jobs was dwindling, at least that Republic is, is getting lower and lower and lower. However, we've got to figure out a way to attract individuals to apply for our roles, find ways to get interest. And to do that, we looked inward, right? We talked to our managers, um, you know, we, we tried to get to know our top performers on a deeper level, you know, to ask them questions like, you know, where do you spend your time? Who do you spend your time with? You know, those types of insights and, and um, you know, a key person in really driving a lot of uh, of these actions was um, the recruiting manager on my team, Rebecca Cooper, who 
oversees our, our call center recruitment to really sort of formulate um, a, a strategy around how we can gather information from our top performing employees and then translate that into recruitment marketing action to drive, increase our candidate flow. And so to do that, what we did is we had conversations, right? We, we, we talked to our, our leaders and said, once you identify 30 of your top performers and let us talk to them. And we, what we tried to do is to understand what are those common traits and interests that those 30 top performers had. Um, we also looked at things like the zip codes in which they live in. You know, we thought about and said, I don't need names of people. I don't need uh, gender. I don't need age. I don't need any of those things. But what I want to know is just where they live. Because we, take the, we took the premise of if good people live around good people. And so if we could market to those individuals within a 20-mile radius of where these other folks live, they may have not considered us as, an, as a potential opportunity. And it could be an untapped talent pool that we have, just, we, we have not necessarily tapped on before. And so what we did from there is we generated some um, campaigns and we, we did, we updated some job titles and we created, we curated content that would connect with individuals th that aligned with those top performers. And we reached out to over 4,001 candidates. And through that action, by sending out SMS texts, by sending out emails, we generated, you know, we doubled our applicant flow, ultimately finding a way to um, fill our position, our, our classes in our call center. And, and, and at the end of the day, it cost us very little investment because we leveraged the, the tool that we already had in place was we already had our talent network. We already had um, the, the ability through our Smashfly platform to send out these messages, whether via, tape, via text and via email and create the content with the templates. And so, uh, you know, doing that saved us a ton and we were able to look like heroes to the business because we now thought outside the box how we leverage our employees. We brought the business involved in with just an overall successful campaign that we continued to leverage these types of strategies um, to move forward and to be uh, innovative in how we, um, you know, how we, we go to market for a recruitment perspective. And, and Shannon, it was probably something that you could you stood up pretty quickly again because you weren't starting from scratch, building kind of that initial talent pool. So pretty, you know, you, you I think what's that phrase? Like you have to either choose, you know, fast, cheap, good. But I feel like this one was you could probably stand it up really quickly. It didn't cost you much money. And like, look at the applicant flow that you got based on top performers. So that was kind of like th three, fast, cheap and good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it was it was it was something we, you know, we, we really thought about it and said, wow, is this really going to work? And we questioned ourselves and we said, you know what, let's just try it and see what happens. Right. If it doesn't work, we'll try something different. And um, I would say as you're as you're driving your, your arm strategy, you know, don't be afraid to pivot. If it doesn't work, try something different. And uh, and for us, we we found something that worked for that particular group and we continue to innovate um, as we go. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, and I imagine, you know, I think right now I, every organization is kind of put in this position where you have to kind of reassess and pivot and really be mindful of, um, of the resources that you have and, and your budget and making sure that you're getting the most out of all those pieces. Um, so I think to, to start kind of winding us down and wrapping up a little bit, I want to take a look at um, the overall, some of the industries that are uh, most prominent right now at the forefront of um, of both our research and actually I think of the current uh, climate um, and the job market overall right now. So if we're looking at recruitment marketing leaders in our benchmarks report, these are the, the industries with that perform the highest. And typically year over year, technology is a kind of a perennial favorite, which makes a lot of sense. Technology companies definitely sell their company culture and their workplaces and they're great at technology. So being able to you know, stand up, um, really engage in career sites and leverage technology in a, in a smart way um, comes as no surprise. But this year we're seeing that healthcare and food and drug stores actually beat them out and have the highest concentration of A's and B's and are really leading the charge um, in the space of recruitment marketing. And, and the same with um, aerospace and then business services, uh, which actually falls under uh, where public services falls under in terms of business logistics and those kind of services. 
So under normal circumstances, each of these industries are already excelling uh, because they're already high growth and have a high demand for quality talent. Um, they know they have to be nimble and well prepared to meet any hiring challenges that may, that may come, whether that's an unexpected hiring freeze, which may be happening right now, um, or having to hire thousands of people next week um, for a big new project that you're trying to launch, or um, in this instance, when you're trying to be on the, the front lines of what is really a, a global crisis afoot. Um, so when we're thinking about uh, looking at these these industries, um, a lot of them fall under these essential services, right? And I think first and foremost, all these employers, they're really trying to communicate the necessary safety precautions and all the health considerations um, that come with, with operating and continuing to move forward as a business, um, even in times of strife. Um, and these are the same people who are, right, are trying to maintain some sense of normalcy in a very much uh, not normal time and trying to make a difference in the lives of millions of people across the country every day. Um, so with this, uh, I'm going to kind of skip ahead a little bit, but um, you'll see in the next slide here, um, just some other RM pioneers or kind of some of these industries that are um, still very much hiring right now. Um, we find that 23% of our pioneers will use a chat bot, and that helps if you're thinking about having an influx of career site visitors and the recruiting teams that are then really overwhelmed by having to, to screen or answer questions or really help people through that hiring process. If you have a chat bot, that, that, or this is Ivy on Intel's site, um, Ivy can answer some really basic questions about open jobs, benefits, life at Intel, and the hiring process overall, which alleviates some of that strain um, from your TA team. And um, I think, oh, sorry, Raquel, just no. something there too that we found that the RM pioneers do, and you just heard this from Shannon, they experiment. Um, I think what's really great about, um, I think people paid in the way in, in, in recruitment marketing is that traditionally like talent acquisition, I think has kind of been a little bit more hesitant um, and they haven't had a lot of budget. So they've had to really make like a small budget go a really far away. We're seeing now with technology, you know, companies like tr testing out how can we actually use AI to screen people? Um, we'll get into CVS right here shortly, but in everything with everything going on, they've seen a 500% increase in traffic to their career site in the past week. There's no way that recruiters can screen every single person coming in. So think about, and they do actually have a chat, but on their site, how that can help um, just kind of get automation rules and initial screening. So it's experimenting to Shannon's point and just finding what works for certain audiences and not having a one size fit all strategy. So that's why we wanted to show that Intel example of testing out new technology, even though it may be really, really early, there's definitely ways in different audiences you can utilize that for. Absolutely, and we're thinking about different audiences as well and, and kind of harkening back to the, the full TA life cycle and that infinity loop, um, internal employees uh, are a really important audience to consider as well. Um, so this was actually the first year of the report where we started to measure which career sites offer an option for employees to apply for jobs or to log in into a, a, an internal career site. Um, so 15% of companies overall offer this option, but there are some that actually go the extra mile and pull that an internal um, marketing strategy into their CRM campaigns. And one quick example of that is from Edison International. This is their largest subsidiary, um, Southern California Edison. And um, they they really wanted to have their internal employees the same internal employees to get the same type of news, tips, uh, brand awareness, and all the really great tools um, and learnings available to their candidates and make it easy for them um, to access that. Uh, as well. So with the CRM campaign that was kind of spaced out over six months, they're able to drive people to watch a video on their intranet and then really keep them engaged and feel like they, they have many opportunities to grow um, and can be really uh, in the loop just as any other candidate would be uh, even more so. Um, so with that, we wanted, as Elise said, to kind of pivot to talk about CVS Health, um, which, uh, if you've read the report, was the number one company on this year's recruitment marketing pioneers list. So out of out of all the five Fortune 500, um, this was definitely the most successful uh, complete TA strategy. Um, but this week, CVS Health is also embarking on their most ambitious hiring drive in the company's history. Um, they announced that they have plans to immediately fill 50,000 roles, um, including store associates, home delivery drivers, distribution center employees, and customer service professionals. 
Um, and what's really impressive about this, I mean, everything is impressive about this because this takes um, tremendous thought and care and preparation. And this team um, using it, the their technology as a foundation, they were actually able to stand up an online COVID-19 full resource center in a, just about a week. Um, and then uh, with that, not having all these resources, it's not easy to pull all that together, but having that foundation of a great library of content and really being thoughtful um, about how they communicate to their employees uh, and to their customers, I mean, to their candidates, um, really set them up for success. Yeah, and I think something else that we're seeing CVS do, and Shannon, I, I'd love your perspective if you've seen this. CVS is starting to use talent network forms um, to kind of get talent lead generation into their CRM by partnering with um, industries that are really struggling right now. So something they just launched, they're working with hospitality companies like Hilton and Marriott, standing up specific talent network forms with messaging to displaced or laid off um, hotel workers and encouraging them to come apply to CVS. They fill out that talent network form. It's getting segmented into the CRM so that recruiters can see which industry they're coming from and what company and what previous role, helping recruiters build a faster pipeline to hit this crazy, crazy um, hiring goal of 50,000 workers. But I don't think I've ever seen companies and industries come together to pool talent in this way. And it was so smart, very strategic, but also so heartwarming to see how we're thinking about the betterment of talent and people right now, but of course also helping to actually fill roles. So Shannon, I'm not sure if like you had seen or heard that, but what is your take on kind of thinking strategically and partnering with other companies in terms of hiring talent at this kind of critical time? Oh, I think it is, is it's fantastic. And yes, at this time, I mean, I think you're seeing it um, prevalent a lot more, um, specifically with a lot of impacted people um, within the, specifically the hospitality space. Um, I came out of that space and have a, a passion for it. And so, yes, it, it, it's definitely a group of, of folks that you want to try and tap into of, of, of a great talent pool. Um, at Republic, we've been doing that not only now, right, where we're in our local communities, partnering with different workforce organizations as they're collecting uh, and connecting with different employers where they have impacted employees. But also we've, we've done it um, with employers directly um, with you know of companies like uh, JCPenney and Sears and some others where they may have been closing their call centers or they're closing their retail locations. And we're partnering with them to try and help fill, help take those employees and put them in opportunities that we have um, as well, or other, let's call it trucking companies that may be going out of business and they have drivers that need opportunities. You know, we've done a lot of these things um, at, at a local level um, as needed to try and capture those folks and put them into our talent pool and, and get them back to work and, and supporting their communities and families. That's amazing. Thanks for sharing. I actually didn't know that Republic was doing that, but it's it's really interesting to work to think through kind of you know, closings and figuring out, again, displaced workers and, and getting that back into the workforce. So I love this Absolutely. and I, 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 I love stories um, of like TA practitioners that seriously, like they always wow me in terms of how, how, how they're thinking of hiring talent. Right, and I think in the ways that they really show candidates, you know, how much they, they care about, mm -hmm. um, you know, about obviously their their day-to-day -day lives and making sure that everybody is safe and sound, but also making sure that, um, that in a time like this where, where unemployment is something on a lot of people's minds, um, how can you help them really get through this hiring process uh, and a new job application process much easier? And I think, uh, you know, CVS is, does a lot of things right. And, I, and one of the things that um, I think is most effective is just really simple, thoughtful content that helps set expectations and really helps candidates um, find their way through the hiring process, which can be pretty challenging. Um, so in an average year, CVS gets about 7 million career site visitors. They receive 3 million job applications. And as we know, with their career site traffic, these numbers are only going to skyrocket. So it's it's particularly critical that, um, that the application process is as easy as possible. So you'll see here some examples of, this is just an infographic that they have on their career site. Um, 
that goes step by step. Steps, so I think it's one through six of you search, apply, review, interview, when to expect a job offer, and just those little steps and those little tips go a long way with people. You know, in a time of uncertainty, to kind of have any information or um, any kind of guide to know what's to come uh, is really, really helpful right now. And I think something that um, endears them to candidates. And then you're able to kind of utilize this content and videos and other um, helpful resume tips and things of that nature in your CRM. Uh, and CVS, I think, has about 3 million candidates or had about 3 million candidates before this week in their talent database. Um, so when something like this arises, they're able to really look back at that that database of those engaged uh, candidates already, they already know their brand. They already have interest in working for CVS and understand its mission, and they've already bought into that mission. Um, so to be able to really tap into that talent pool right now, I think is going to be invaluable. Yeah, definitely. And I think a, a really big lesson learned is any content that goes on your career site, you should always be thinking about where else that content can live. Can you text it? Can you turn it into, you know, an email? Can you turn it into a, a segmented email? Um, what goes on social? And I think, you know, Shannon, you guys have built some really amazing employee stories and content too. And you were talking about kind of a multi-pronged approach. That's something in the benchmark report that we see, you know, over 60% of a lot of Fortune 500 companies have a lot of the content on their career site. But then you guys remember we shared only 8% share content other than jobs. It really is just about thinking what you're creating in one channel and figuring out how to reuse it in another channel. And I hope in the next year or two, we see that sending content other than jobs and then talent network doubles, triples, quadruples, because I think it's just that last step into thinking in an omni-channel uh, approach. All right, so we are about nine minutes left. Um, thanks so much. I feel like nearly everyone who started is still with us and please feel free to, um, to get to get your tough question. Shannon told me when we were going through a run through, he likes the tough questions. So get get them in there. <laughs> but we actually do have a few come through. I want to get this for this first one because we actually had talked about this, Shannon. Someone asked about geo targeting and in terms of is this discriminatory? Um, and like how how is that un, how is that not biased to look at geo targeting when you're thinking through uh, talent pools? Yeah, so for us, it wasn't necessarily discriminatory because we didn't necessarily scrub this, the talent pool based on any sort of gender or um, any sort of ethnic uh, background or anything like that. Really, all we wanted to know was indiscriminately, who are the top performers? And then where do those top performers live? Because we want to target that market of people. Um, not necessarily that we wanted to target a specific group or that one was better than the other. I mean, we didn't. We did also target a broad group of people as well, but we wanted to make sure that we send out targeted messaging based on what we've gotten from a broad group of folks. So um, we got a diverse group of individuals. So for that reason, it, it didn't necessarily go into that space of di discrimination, um, because although um, we we also kind of scrubbed the data so that way the team also didn't have any um, call it uh, biases along with it. So. Our, uh, our performance management metrics are, don't have a bias in it, specifically in our call center. Um, and so we could defend that any day of the week. Well, and, and, and how I look at it is like you guys, um, you didn't have like a hypothesis, like you wanted this gender or this education and then went after it. You actually looked at current top performers across the board. And it wasn't like you were eliminating other zip codes from the job. Um, you know, you, no. you were actually just trying to target. It's just like, I feel like if you make a decision to go to Harvard career fairs every year in terms of like a different school, it's not really, it's just, you're just trying to figure out like, what are you looking for? What, what, what are top performers and how do you actually promote that job to an audience that you're trying to get engaged, but you're not only promoting it to that, to, to that audience. And you're not um, taking people out of the running who aren't in that, that audience, right? Correct. Yeah, yeah, absolutely not. Yep. Okay. Um, another, an, yeah, another question that came in. So looking at current state and not actually talking about like really COVID related messaging, but in terms of uh, communicating a hiring freeze or the novelty of working from home, 
some of these other kind of bigger things going on, like say halting the interview process, you know, with all of this going on, how, how would you look at mapping out like communications to, to your talent community right now? And what, what might you send or how would you go about that? Yeah, I think uh, when you when you when you're thinking about messaging to your networks, you have to be very sort of prescriptive about the message that you want to portray, right? So, you know, is it is there value in sending out a message to your network that says you're on a hiring freeze? Um, and I think at every organization, they, there there needs to be that conversation internally that says, is this a valuable message to send out? Um, I think when you think about evolving the process of specifically in the environment where we are now with COVID-19 and companies even like ours are now shifting to more of a virtual recruitment process and experience where we're leveraging more video interviews and more phone uh, versus having individuals come on site face to face. Um, and, and so creating a message that says, you know, we're still here. Um, we're still hiring. Um, the process may have evolved slightly um, with us leveraging more of the technology and virtual experience. But, you know, we're st we still want to meet you. We're still excited and we still have great opportunities. So I, I think it, it really comes into play around what is the message you're trying to portray, uh, per you know, say, per portray, but then also what is the audience? What do you want your audience to know um, about your organization and then and go from there? Yeah, and I think something, too, now, especially if you're going on an entire hiring freeze, one, it's not unexpected. Um, this is seriously one of the first... <laughs> the first things that I've been through in my lifetime where every single person is being affected by this in some way. But I think it's a really strong time to talk about what you believe in and your brand. So being honest and saying like right now, given the current situation in business, you know, we, we, are, we are halting hiring for the quarter, but we'd love for you to still hear from employees on the front lines or what we're doing from work from home. I think it's a really good area to not go dark let people know that maybe your jobs are not open right now, but your brand and company and your people are always open because we are going to get through this and you will start hiring again at some point. So as a marketer, I always love brands that are, that are honest and that are simple and that really sound like they're talking from the heart. And I think like those are the types of messages people need to hear right now. So even if they're, you're closing jobs, I think you can still say like, but our brand is still open. Come back to us in three months, come back to us in six months. We'll be sharing what we're doing in the meantime. Okay, so we have a few more minutes. Um, we have a few more coming in. So someone asked, are you incorporating any verbiage on your career site, in your job postings, or in social media that addresses hiring during COVID-19 right now for, for Republic Services? Yeah, so we actually we're we're looking to push that out. Um, we we drafted the 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 message that we're going to add into all of those, um, and we're just actually just waiting to push those out. So yes, you'll start seeing the updates to our career site. We're going to be sending out message to our um, talent pool and our talent networks on sort of our position. Um, we're just waiting for the final approval from our external communications team um, to push out that message and make those necessary updates. So absolutely, it is coming. And so Shannon, I mean, would you say that this was a, a good, a really good partnership and kind of cross-functional across your business or even talent acquisition and marketing to kind of get this messaging in place? Yeah, I, mean, I work my, myself and my team work really closely with our marketing department. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the things that, especially depending on the size of your organization, um, you know, I'm not a marketing expert, right? So I don't have a marketing back of degree. Uh, but what I do have is a really good team of marketing folks in, the de in our marketing department that we can leverage um, to help make sure we're crafting the right message that are also making sure that we are aligning with the overall uh, message of the organization, but also having the talent acquisition um, spin on things. And so it's, it's, a, it's a great marriage. We don't have a lot of resources. So I don't have anyone on my team that is 100% dedicated to the recruitment marketing campaigns is it's very much so a team effort. Uh, and so it, it's definitely, you gotta have that partnership and leverage the resources that you have to make sure that you are um, pushing out the right messages that everyone's aligned with. Definitely. Um, I know we have one minute left. There's two questions here. So maybe we could quickly get to both. 
What is your thought on totally removing job postings during this time if you're not hiring? Would you just take them off the site? Would you close them? What What is your thinking behind that? Ooh, um, that's a good question, right? And I guess it depends on what you classify as not hiring. So mm -hmm. if you are if you are still going through the interview process, you're still collecting resumes and um, and and those sort of things, then I would say. Uh, you may not necessarily be making offers, but you're getting candidates to a point in which all the, all you have to do now is make offers when you're ready. Um, I don't necessarily think you take down your your your, uh, your positions. However, um, I always say you got you need to treat your positions like real estate, right? So you know you're going to get the most bang for your buck when you're trying to sell real estate um, in the early on stages of it being posted. So if they're going to sit and do nothing, then I think you take them down. Um, because they're just going to become, they're going to fall, they're going to fall flat on the aggregate sites. You're not okay. going to get as much traffic and they're, just, you know, so, you know, you've got to, you've got to balance out, you know, what are you, what do you really mean by not hiring? And then if you're just not going to do anything, one, you want, you want to make sure you, I would take them down and also just think about the candidate experience. Yeah. And, and I'll just end on this and then we'll close down. Raquel talked about uh, talent network uh, opt-ins and the apply flow. Even if you have some messaging where we will currently not be interviewing, but if you're interested in these jobs, you know, still please apply. You actually could be fueling your talent pool if you do think you're going to hire for that role in three months. So I guess to Shannon's point, if you're still interested in talent and think you're going to be hiring within a certain time frame, you might just want to shift instead of making them apply into the ATS. Just get their email, their skills, and get them into the CRM. And then you have them and you can actually like reach back out to them later. So you're not totally not generating any talent interest at this time. All right. Yep. I know we're Leverage one minute talent over. Network. Yeah, exactly. So I know we're one minute over. Thanks so much for joining Shannon. We appreciate you so much. Thank you for being so honest, sharing your story. You guys are doing so much amazing work um, across the board. Uh, and we will try to get to any other uh, unanswered questions, either on social or, or a blog post. But thanks so much, everyone. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank Have you. a great afternoon. Stay safe. Have a good afternoon. Bye.